Um, hi everyone, it's my first time using Dropbox paper, so I'm using cutting edge stuff, so if it's not good, it's cutting edge stuff. <laughs> Alright, today I'm going to talk about deploying Swift on IBM Vumix. Um, I, am, I do not work for IBM. Um, <laughs> all right. The uh, reason why I choose to talk about IBM is because they're the only cloud provider that choose to take on Swift as a first class citizen. So that's pretty exciting for us. Um, client side people normally on Swift, um, they have a strategic partnership. I think because Tim Cook used to work at IBM, so they are very good friends. So for the first time, like Apple technology can be on the back end, you know. Now what, what is IBM Bluemix? Now I, I'm going to assume, I'm going to choose the lowest common denominator, right? I'm going to assume you guys are all client side people and you don't really think about the back end, your, your, your back end guy just hands you some like REST URLs and then you just work from there, right? So I'm going to talk about a uh, brief history of um, web back end slash infrastructure. Um, so what is cloud? What, what is a pass? So let's revisit the server dark ages in the 90s, right? Back then servers used to be in these glass boxes and these glowing rooms. And back then people used to look at this pretty hologram stuff to navigate through their files. No, that's, this is a movie. <laughs> I don't know. This shows my age, I think. Um, this is a movie called Hackers uh, 1995. That came out in 1995. Um, this is reality, all right, back <laughs> in the 90s. Um, apparently it was quite horrendous. So like uh, Elon Musk, all those PayPal guys, they used to manage servers like this in their apartment or something. Um, stuff breaks down, stuff catches on fire, they have a fire extinguisher. You know, and, and if your startup grew like crazy, you know, it, it was the real dark ages. And, <laughs> and this is the real photo, and I could never find the source of it. I don't know who, who created this nightmare. You see, do not touch these wires. I wouldn't want to touch. I, I, I scared I go in, I cannot come up. So it was, it was really the dark ages, right? Um, and then, you know, the age of cloud computing, the advent of uh, Amazon Web Services. And, uh, and the roof start looking like the hackers movie, right? So this is a, a real Amazon data center. I don't know if they're using custom hardware or whatever. Looks really cool. You don't have to manage all those stuff yourself anymore, right? You, you, you pretty, pretty much outsource um, hardware and, and manage it, things like you know, if stuff catches on fire, redundancy, resilience, air conditioning, dust, you don't have, you don't have to be building a startup and also hiring hardware people to manage your hardware. So, they are, you know, they're obviously really popular. I'm sure all of you use it, um, and they're everywhere, right? If you notice, there's no single region where they have less than two data centers. Um, that's how fast they're growing. Now, that was in... 2006, um, which is not that long ago, right? Uh, one, immediately one year after that, um, Heroku came out. And if you don't know why Heroku is like just mind-blowing, um, you can do a Heroku create, right? Do a push, detects what code you have, and it's online, right? Um, and when Heroku came out, it only supported Rails apps. And uh, they were trying to solve a very specific problem, right? Um, before Rails, it was all like Java stuff, enterprise stuff, you need to deploy your own servers. Uh, either that or you're doing PHP. Um, and Rails app was really hard to deploy because you are building, hmm, how do I show that? You, you're building a script that hooks onto the socket directly and not many web servers that give you that kind of privilege. So you need like, you need, you need your own, and this was before VMs, right? So. Like, you need your own dedicated server for this. And they're like, screw that, we're gonna solve that for you. You just sign up for an account, you do a push to our URL and your app is up. So this is the fine line between um, what you call um, IAAS, Infrastructure as a Service, where they just give you bare bones servers. This is a PaaS, uh, P-A-A-S, where on top of the infrastructure, they give you the runtime, you don't get to choose your OS, you don't get to choose your stack in a way. Uh, if they don't support Rails, you're gone. Um, but they made it super developer friendly. Um, Google obviously saw this was an exciting thing. Um, and they came out with the App Engine um, two years after Amazon Web Services. 
And you know, you, you, some people thought that Google Compute Engine came first, but actually it was the App Engine came first. So they were more inspired by Heroku than they were by um, Amazon Web Services. And this was the first time we got to saw, get to see uh, Google's data centers, and it's like that's that's cool. I I want my code running on that, whatever those pipes are. Right. Microsoft, you know, I don't know. They, they they still make money from Windows, but they you know stopped making as much money at some point. Um, not as much money at some point, and they, and they knew they needed a new direction, and they decided wisely to choose cloud computing. Right. They launched Microsoft Asia. And I think today they are already the second largest because you know, they embrace open source, they make things so cheap, they undercut everyone, they just threw up money at, at everyone. Um, and then IBM Cloud came out, right? And they are the, they are the last one, right? Out of the big four, like, you know, enterprise uh, traditional computing uh, companies. And you can tell they are, they are less focus, you know, oh, let's, let's do this logo, and then they rebrand. It's like, as mentioned, uh, then Google Compute Engine came out because um, if you really study how the market grew, um, oddly, uh, Pass was not as popular. I think, um, I think there's a lot of server DevOps people out there like, hey, if, if you do like a Pass, like, I'll be out of a job. <laughs> So they're like, no, no, you should use Amazon, right? I'll deploy a service. I still deploy it for you, except we don't need to think about like hardware and stuff. So the the demand for uh, IA, IAS um, far outstripped past. Um, a lot of people say this may not be a long-term thing. Um, maybe it really is outstripping demand because you know those ops people have to work on something, <laughs> right? Um, People say eventually pass will maybe overtake uh, iOS in the future, but uh, I don't know. So they came out, the Compute Engine, and this is Google's data center for Compute Engine, and this looks like the hackers movie, right? <laughs> right? No, no 3D interface to navigate your files, but good enough for me. So all these acronyms are true at you, right? Infrastructure as a service, Platform as a service, software as a service, and bare metal. So what's the difference? So bare metal is what you saw um, earlier, right? That thing, that red snare in the room is on the left. You manage everything. Infrastructure as a service is like AWS, where they do everything from data centers to virtualization. Um, you don't, you make, you don't have to know that virtualization is there um, because they just give you like a like a like a VM instance. Um, and you can treat it like as though you had a bare metal server. And everything on top you manage yourself. Um, platforms like Heroku and Google App Engine, um, obviously they don't write your app for you. <laughs> so we as developers uh, will then use platform service to then maybe build a software as a service for our customers. This is a rough timeline. Um, Heroku was not the first part. Uh, there was one called Engineer, which was trying to solve the exact same problem um, that I described for Heroku, which is, you know, someone somewhere, someone somewhere wants to host Rails code, where do they do it? Um, but they, 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 because it was so early days, right, they actually had their own data centers, they had regions, you know, they were not in AWS and whatever, and it was still fairly stripped down, it was not as easy as Git push and you code this up, um, there was still a lot of hand wiring up. So they, they were more like a, somewhere between the IS and a pass. Um, and it wasn't until 2009 that they decided, hey, uh, we don't even want to manage our own data centers. It's actually, we still can make money if we go on AWS. And they only did it in 2009. Um, so if you notice, like, AWS also came out with a pass, Elastic Beanstalk. Um, which is not as convenient as Heroku. Um, I'll let you discover that yourself. But if you notice, everyone is, all the big guys anyway, is in two, both of the roles, except IBM. So, so IBM has to answer, what is IBM? So IBM came out with Bluemix, which is the past for IBM. Now, their approach is quite different from everyone. They choose not to 
build like a mystery black box like Heroku. Like, it, okay, the API is very clear. If you go to Heroku Docs, it says if you do this, you get that. If you do this, do that. Everything's through the command line. You know, you can do like Heroku at domain, and your domain has SSL now. You know, it's just one line. But no, nobody has seen the code, right? It's a black box. If it breaks down, if it, you, do, you, don't know, you don't know what's happening. I, yeah, I deploy my app, but it's not working. Why? And you check with the little error logs they give you and try to infer which line of code they have that's you know, giving you trouble. Uh, Cloud Foundry is an open source pass. So you can go to GitHub, you can download Cloud Foundry, and you can deploy your own pass onto any cloud you want. The problem is you have to manage it yourself, obviously. So IBM choose to adopt Cloud Foundry. Um, yep, they choose to adopt Cloud Foundry um, as a managed Cloud Foundry solution. So now you have a stack which you can even inspect the code of, and you are getting the benefits of um, you know something managed. So you need to think about like, a hey, the memory is like you know. I have a memory leak in this library and it's bringing down my, my website. Um, they will actually you know, monitor that for you. But you can still inspect the code and find out exactly what's wrong and fix and even push fix. So a bit, well, it's not three words, but it's still fairly, fairly, fairly straightforward. You go Cloud Foundry push, my app, you want two instances, um, they have 5, 12 memory each. So it even knows how to allocate the container of a specific size. Um, call it name, my app version one. Uh, this is the path of my wall file. Wall file because uh, they initially choose to adopt Java as the, as the, the default runtime uh, because they want to take over the enterprise market. So, build packs, what are build packs? Build packs are again modeled after Heroku. Uh, build pack is how code on the server knows that you are running a certain framework or a certain runtime and knows how to build your app uh, by inferring just from the directory structure. Um, I can see that um, Cloud Foundry supports a lot of runtimes. I won't go into that. Um, and then on Bluemix, they support Swift. So if you go and see this WDC, WWC, which I won't play because it will take an hour, um, they should talk about this partnership with Apple um, on how you deploy um, Swift code onto the backend, which is sort of what I'm going to show you today. So demo. OK, so I have this. I have this app called uh, Latinizer. Okay, what does Latinizer do? Uh, very basic. All right. I just have a UI label here and a text field here. And all I do is I just call my library and say Latinize. And let's look at this struct. Right. It's just one function, right? It's just one function. So what sorcery does this do? So it can turn any language into um, alphabets. All right, I don't know if you guys know about this feature. In, um, <laughs> uh, it's been there since Objective-C days in the next, next days. Um, they wrapped Unicode library. Um, it doesn't just work with Chinese, obviously. Uh, anything that can be Latinized, like Japanese, um, Hindi, anything. Um, They'll give you the proper Latin alphabet version of it. So great. I have this app and I'm like, hey, it's so popular. I want everyone to use it. Let's make a website. Ah, oh, but my code is in Swift. What should I do? Okay. <laughs> ah, I blame Bluemix came up with Swift support. So all you have to do is just create I've got to set up your account, right? Um, you download this thing called IBM Tools, IBM Cloud Tools for Swift. That's all you have to do. You just set up your account and download this little, little tool. 
let's see if internet will fail me today. Because I'm talking about the cloud and I can't function without the internet. Oh no, spinning beach ball. Cross <laughs> Sorry? Vapor. Vapor. They support um, all the frameworks actually. I will demonstrate soon. <laughs> so let's try that again. So apparently there are some IBM guys here today if they came. <laughs> so they should report this. <laughs> Ta-da! So they initially started with just this sample app, um, but now they give you like um, to do this is very straightforward, right? Um, but they have weird things like cognitive concierge. So I don't know if you heard of IBM Watson. Uh, it's IBM's AI framework service, whatever, uh, which they now expose through a REST API. Um, so, so something like Siri Keeper with AI. So you can actually, you know, build an app to play chess with Ivan Watson and try to win it, I don't know. Call it Grandmaster, Mobile Grandmaster or something. Um, so what you do is uh, Kitura is the web framework um, that IBM built um, because Apple's obviously not gonna build a web framework, so they did. And they actually use Kitura in production now. Um, so it's like, it's not beta, it's not, it's not alpha, it's, it's actually used in production IBM, so you can, it's stable, right? Um, so you name your project, blah, 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 and you create a project. So I've, I've created that already. Um, it's called Latinizer. And this is my code. Hmm. So if, if you look into like open source, no, mm. Swift on Linux, um, you have your typical package file and all that. Um, it's not too different. I'll just briefly explain what it is. Um, here I'm downloading the latest Kitura 1.6.2 maybe now. Um, this is what exactly what it says it is. Um, can I explain this? Okay, I'll explain this. So the way you manage secrets in the backend is you set them as environment variables so that you don't deploy your secrets into your code, into your repo. So when you deploy it, when you git push, um, and your app is compiled, you will actually just read off the environment or wherever it's deployed. Um, that's a bit funky with Swift. Like, when was the last time you accessed an environment variable from Swift? <laughs> Never. I mean, you can actually, in, in, in Scheme and all that, you actually can set environment variables here, but it's very rarely used. Everyone uses the info key list. So, Um, ignore this, these are all the other libraries that this guy pulls as well, the dependencies. So, um, if you, even if you don't know what Kitura is, uh, it's super straightforward, right? Um, this is the key, you import this guy, um, all you have to do is just add the HTTP server and press run, and you'll run as a web server locally on your computer already. Alright? Uh, if that's an error, then just spit out the error and exit. Uh, so this is where our application, right? Um, this is your code. I call it controller. You can call it Latinizer controller. Anything you want. Just have to pass the port and something called a router. Right? So this is your code. Uh, this is the environment thing. You can ignore this line. We are not using it. Well, we sort of are. Cloud Foundry is using it. So you have to initialize a router. And a router will just tell, well, when a request comes in, you route it to the right place to do the right thing, depending on the URL. All right, and I created a point where if you post uh, to latinize, slash latinize, um, you do this function. All right. Um, set my response header. All I do is I read um, the content body. So it's not JSON, it's just pure plain text. 
um, Latinize it, and that's my the same Swift file, all right, that I have here. My Swift struct. Check if it's empty. Blah blah. If it can be Latinized, if I send a 200 and OK, and send my response. And otherwise, back request can't Latinize. And so these are all the boilerplate that you need to put your library in now. That's the thing, right? <laughs> you have to deploy on Linux. And if you try to compile this on Mac OS, it will just complain, hey, this function is not available on Mac OS. <laughs> so if you want this code to run locally, um, you use your local Swift and you will use foundation like Apple Foundation, not open source foundation. You might have to run some guards if you want it to run locally um, and on the Linux server. Right. But that's not all. Right, so this is the OS 10 guard. As it turns out, uh, they changed the library. They actually changed this method signature from an enum um, to take a string instead. Um, this enum actually wraps this string. I still don't know why they did that. I think it's because um, they don't want to op open source certain parts of the foundation library um, and they are forcing people to port some of these functions over um, brand new. Um, so you have to do really funky stuff like, you know, like an if. Like a compiler if. And to make, to add insult to the injury, there's no NS string. And, and this function, which they ported over but not 100%, um, is only available as an NS string on Linux. And you can't convert, it's not bridge like it is in, in Mac. Um, you have to do weird casting like this to get around this. Uh, yeah, so. Yeah, I'm pretty putting you off deploying on Linux now. <laughs> but that's what you have to do for certain functions. Uh, not all, but certain functions. If you, by some chance, happen to be developing Swift on Linux fully, you won't see these issues. But you're going to use Xcode and Mac OS X, you have to be very mindful of this weird stuff, which is all not documented. I have to read code to find out what, what's happening. There are bug reports here and there. All right. Now, once this is solved, you can compile. All right, so I can build it, boom, build succeeded, fantastic. All right, and here's, here's, here's where it's brilliant, right? All you have to do is just press this button, it gets deployed. All right, now I've deployed already, I can remove it, but okay, let's, let's, just, let's just do it. And I hope internet doesn't fail on me now. All right. Oops. All my taps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I use a different password for everything, so. Ah. Uh. So you need to create an app on uh, the console first. Oh, you need the runtime. Once you have the runtime, then that deploys. Okay, so even with Heroku and all that, right? They they need to do some setup on the on the on the cloud side, so that they have something to get pushed to. So you need to create an app um, on on the cloud foundry first. Like you remember the Heroku create line, yeah. I'm sort of doing that, but through the through the web interface now. Because I think most Swift developers don't like to use the command line.
So you just go here, Cloud Foundry Apps. Spinning. Hmm, Angular. <coughs> Create a Swift app, where are you? <coughs> okay, when, when I do, did this at home, it's really fast. <laughs> Just so you know. It's not IBM's fault. No, uh, I'll explain why later. <laughs> yep, it's going all the way to Austin, Texas. Right, so I created an app called Latinizer. Uh, they'll give me a domain a subdomain, and I call it Latinizer as well. And I believe this part takes some time. <laughs> I didn't factor that in, actually. Alright. Um, so this... This is literally live. Um, it's creating... I don't know if you've heard about Docker and containers and all that shebang recently. Um, so they, they model the infrastructure after container. Um, you can see it's, it has a built pack version and um, it's getting Swift and it's unpacking Swift and it's compounding Clang and all that um, into the container. It's like, hey, hang on, I haven't pushed my code yet. Uh, that's because when you create a Swift project, um, it has some starter project which it initially creates first. Uh, if you want, you can do a deep pool of that and then work on that. Or you can just override it and just push, push, uh, push your code up. Yeah. Makes no difference because um, every time you get, do a deep push, they actually destroy the container. And they look at your code and they're like, okay, I should build it this way. And they'll build a new container around your code and then deploy that container. So it's, it's site, it's like, um, what's the word? Each deploy is, is isolated from one another. Now that's that's excellent too. So because you change a lot of things, you may change a lot of things between deploys, right? Between uh, revisions, um, and you know one deployment doesn't affect another. And you can do really funky stuff. Well, it's not funky. It's normal now. You can just issue a command like rollback, and it remembers the old container, and it will destroy the container, and it will bring up the container that existed right before that. Uh, so it's taking some time because it's actually pulling the entire. Uh, well, it has Ubuntu already, but it's updating Ubuntu now, putting everything it needs to pull to build Clang. So, um, I guess one, one disadvantage, if you call it disadvantage, is setup takes a little bit longer um, than rolling out your own bare metal VM. Um, but you'll see the benefits a while later when um, development benefits. Uh, because even though it takes long, at least everything is done for you and you don't need to. You don't need to debug security fixes, you don't need to debug like, you know, all sorts of things that you hire operations for, which is why the jobs are threatened. Okay, so um, here you can see it's compiling uh, the starter project. Um, so, if you want to use another term of like paper, then by default they already installed it, right? Yeah, so like I said earlier, this is its own container. This container has code that says, hey, I want Kitura. Right? So if you git pull this and you change your package, you know, the package.swift, and you say, I want Vapor now. When you deploy the code, how far you look at your code and say, hey, uh, we'll, we'll, know not, we'll know nothing about the previous one. You just look at code, oh, you use Vapor, and then it will start pulling Swift and Vapor. And then construct a new container and deploy that container. So from deploy to deploy, it has no memory. 
whatever you push, you'll look at it and it'll construct a brand new, I won't call it VM, it's actually a container. A container is like a very lightweight VM. Um, and then deploy that. All right, uh, I'll show you other stuff. <laughs> so it costs money, but we'll come to that. Um, uh, here's, here's the really cool part, right? Um, after you created your app, you can, oh shit, Latinizer is so popular. Everyone loves it. You know, I have like the 800 million, million and 1 billion Chinese customers using it because they want to Latinize whatever they're saying. And I need 10 servers. And you just need to tap this nine times and you'll have 10 servers. All right? Um, you can't do that without a pass. You just can't. Right, and increase memory if you happen to have a memory hungry application and that happens to be your bottleneck. So if you have a CPU bottleneck, you know, increase instances. If you have a memory bottleneck, increase memory. Uh, environment variables I mentioned earlier, you can put secrets here and they will get embedded into your view. And you can SSH into that container and do stuff. Ah, running. So let's jump back here. So it's trying to connect now. Why are there no logs? It's running. Of course, it's deployed. Oh, I think it knew. My code hasn't changed. Really? Oh, no. I have to press this button, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, boom. Uh, you're seeing the exact same messages that you see just now, but now it's deploying my code. So this takes some time and you can go have coffee or whatever. Um, but that's it. All you have to do is write code, um, set it at runtime, press this button. So it's building a container. Yeah, which is like a VM. Yeah. But better. And I can explain to you after the talk why. First. All right, it's cloning, it's actually um, cloning all the libraries now. And you can see it's... So you need the VM dot? You need the VM dot offline testing? What do you mean offline testing? Uh, can you access it inside your... Yeah. So, so this is what this is for. All right. You can, after it's built, it's, it's like a VM. You can just do SSH and modify it any way you want. But, but you don't do that because, like I said, every time you git push, a new container is created, right? So everything you customize after that is destroyed and a new VM is created. Even if you change one line of code and you git push, they'll create a new container. There are benefits to this, um, which I won't go into. Um, so you are always building from a clean slate. When you say git push, how do the locals know that that is the remote? Ah, good question. Thanks to this tool. <laughs> so when you create um, a new project that I saw just now, it sets up like your Git repo. I mean, you should be able to see it in Xcode. Let's see if I can bring it up. Mm, can I see remotes here? I normally use Git on the command line, so. <laughs> How do you look for remotes? Should I jump on the command line? Anyway, it's there. It, it has to work that way. <laughs> Um, it will set up your remotes properly, uh, and when you press this, it will point to the right git, obviously. Uh, so that when you press this button... Uh, what I mean is that if I use something now to, to git push, it will now know that it's actually deploying to the, to the idea. Mm, you know what? I've never tried it before. Mm, right after this. Yeah, 
It will. I don't know if the command line 2 knows. No, sorry, I don't know if the cloud 2, this guy will know. Does that answer your question? Okay. Hmm, container became healthy, so this should say running now. Running. This is my web version. Um, right. It works. And it's running on Swift. So this is Swift on the server. Yay. <laughs> Now, sorry? Why? You still have to use HTML5 though. I'll show you. So this, this is my HTML code. Yeah. Um, and this does a post to my Latinize. Alright, so, sorry. <laughs> it runs in the browser. Okay. So I'll cut out one presentation. So that was exciting, right? So that was the main part of my talk. So this is bonus, all right? Um, you even have something called function and service now. So you can run functions, functions in the application that are managed by them. And you build applications from functions. Um, Amazon Lambda was the first one. You build something called serverless apps. Right? And it really means what it means, it's serverless. You just hook it up through your web interface, certain functions like Latinize, whatever, um, and your, your client can be a web app or mobile app. Uh, when, it, when it's web app, I mean just JavaScript running in a browser, and you actually have no servers um, that you manage yourself. Right? Um, it runs, Amazon Lama runs, well, they launch with Node.js runtime. Uh, all you have to do is just write this function and deploy it, and you can call it, and it just gives you a response. Um, it's a bit crazy to use Amazon Lambda um, in Swift as you can tell. So the bold text is your code, right? And everything else is boilerplate. Can I run Swift on Lambda? You can't. But apparently you can deploy zip files. Right? So these are the lines I inserted. Uh, you can bundle the whole Swift binary and call Swift binary and then from Node and then return your results. And it doesn't work, why? You couldn't find a Swift library. Uh, so apparently there's a workaround by this guy called Justin Sanders. Um, you have to find these random shared objects that are around the file system and put it in. Um, and then it will work. So Google Functions came out uh, last year, Alpha, uh, Asia. So where's IBM again, right? So IBM came out with a beta on February last year. But they officially launched in November. That's insane, right? And it supports Swift. So now you can deploy just Swift functions into, into the cloud. Right? Serverless, right? Not just functions, but you can create rules and you know triggers around them. So say you have a cron job, you, you want to clean your database every every week once. Uh, you can just deploy one Swift function and create a trigger and you know that Swift code will, 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 will you know touch the database every week. And it's hundred percent open source, right? So functions as a service. The framework is open source on GitHub. Right? So on OpenBIS, you just need to write these three lines. Actually, it's two lines of code or one line of code. Right? If you get a string any, you know, I'm not, obviously not inspecting arcs. Uh, you can just return a JSON as, as, a, as a map. Um, and on iOS, a lot less boilerplate, of course. Uh, but there's still a lot of boilerplate. But it's really just this line, right? Um, I want to call this function, you just call it invoke action, and everything else is actually business logic. I would give a demo. But <laughs> uh, is, is serverless the future? Uh, don't know. Um, there are actually frameworks now, so think of it like Rails 
for serverless or, or Django, Python for serverless, where you just run command line tools and you say, oh, set up this route. I have this object called persons and they have a name and an age field. And it will actually go and set up the, the serverless database for you. They'll set up those functions that call those database all for you behind the scenes. Right? And it works with OpenMIST. It works apparently with uh, Google Alpha as well, but apparently not that good. It definitely works with Amazon Lambda. It's primarily for Amazon Lambda. I don't know if we have time for questions, but that's the end of it. Cool. Should I give the demo? If there are no questions on the function as a Swift, I actually built it already. I have a question. So where is point five? Do you recommend to run Swift on the server side? If you have a very simple service, right. especially if it hooks into IBM Watson API, however, you can. It's, in, it's production ready. Okay. Well, where would you, where would you recommend that over the last four to be turned as traditional way of doing that? You want to write Swift in the back end, and you don't want to learn Python, Ruby, Django, Go. <laughs> and I, you know, Kitura is a 100% Swift framework. You have to learn web development in a way, and you still have to like deliver HTML, CSS, whatever you're going to do a website. But that's it. But if I'm building a mobile backend, I, I, don't want, I don't need to touch HTML, CSS, JS. I just want the server to do something, some logic, and then send me some JSON down. You can actually just write a one Swift function. So one of the demos that IBM gave is, um, so they're calling the weather API from IBM, right? IBM has a weather API. You just send it some that long, and it gives you the, you know, the forecast. And you know, you, all you give is just a lat long, right? They're going to give you like this huge chunk of like responses or whatever. Uh, which city do you want? I'll give them all to you anyway. And maybe you can cut it down, whatever. But even if you cut it down to the exact cities you want, um, what if I only care about the current temperature and, and not the high or the low, you know, for the day? Um, you can write a Swift function that, you know, so you hit this Swift function and Swift function will then hit the forecast API. Then it gets the results from Amazon and it will actually filter down exactly what you want and all this is still on the back end and then send you the minimum amount of code down to your app. Right? That's, that's insanely useful, right? I don't have to learn like a whole Ruby or Rails framework just because I want this Swift function in the back end. Yep. It's faster than Node. It's really fast. Uh, I don't know if it's faster than Go. Uh, I haven't done any benchmark myself. But from what I read, um, it will definitely be faster than Go because of the deterministic, um, you know, uh, memory management. Because it uses ARC, right? Um, GC has a garbage collector. So if you've done Android development, you know they have issues with things pausing, especially when you do games, because the Java, you know, runtime says, "Hey, I'm going to collect all these objects," and your game is like suffering. Um, ARC and you know, retain, release, all that completely sidesteps. Um, all of that. So there's no there's no garbage collection there's no gar garbage collection cost. It should in theory run even faster than Go. So that's why IBM invest so heavily in it. It might just take over the world. Swift doesn't have garbage collection. That's just that, that's just the language. Um, that's what app is. I don't know right, if, you, if you're from the old days, you literally have to manage memory. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, of course. Like, I, I 
Actually, it does it in the foreground. It's just hidden from you. When when you compile your code, they insert the retain and release calls. So yeah. you just don't see. <laughs> it's simple that previously we had to do it previously. It's just that you have to do it manually back then. Yeah. Am I retaining this? Am I releasing this? If you release it, the boom, your program will explode. If you don't release it, you get memory leak. All right. Um, there's no way you can have a memory leak in Java. Right. Uh, I think. Uh, Actually, you can. Sorry. Not all the actually not all not all garbage collectors will follow the DUI and run the same. In fact, part of the current one will do that, and also it depends on how you thread your application. So yeah. it's wrong to say that actually garbage collection will cause DUI on the common Android application per se. Yeah, so even Android just fixed that recently, um, like with the art runtime and that one or two years ago. Uh, but that's they still. They call it the stop the world garbage collection, right? They just have, because you can't be creating objects while I was trying to inspect, hey, okay, so which objects should I clean now? Oh yeah, you're creating all these new objects, right? It still has to pause you and has to look at, they call, they call it mark and sweep, mark, sweep, okay, destroy. Then they run the application again. With deterministic memory, right? there's no pause anywhere at all. Okay, you wouldn't want to do that. Uh, RAM is optimized for ARM, I think, ARM processors. I don't think that's a Linux. Yeah, but RAM runs a little bit. Yeah. Yeah? You're talking about RAM, the database, right? Yeah. You wouldn't want to do that anyway. They, they have a web service, like RAM Manage. You want to keep API calls. Okay. Remember, you're not supposed to keep any state on your container. Remember, the container is destroyed and you create a new one based on your code. So if you, if you, if you have realm in your, in your container and you put stuff in it, the next deploy, all your objects are gone. So good, proper web development practice is keep state like databases, everything out of your web code. Because you have one database, right? And you deploy as many web instances as you can to keep that one database. To, that's how you scale. Uh, so if you deploy RAM, you're embedding the database in your web app, which is bad practice. Cool, fantastic.